this war as being the war, the second independence war, or it should be the second, gosh, I'm, second war for independence. Because again, who are we fighting? Britain. And really, is Britain at this moment respecting us? What is happening in the ocean? Impressment and stealing our cargo. What's happening on our land? They're trading with the Indians and they're here on our land. Are they respecting our independence? Mm -hmm. So I always think about this as a second war for independence. Why should we have a second war? We already won our independence. And this is why many people say that this is a war that should have never been fought. Do y'all know of a war that most people say today that should have never been fought? Okay, Vietnam. Vietnam, because there's going to be a lot of people who are entirely against it. And this is the same thing of that animosity that we'll see in the War of 1812. And we're going to see that this animosity actually is going to be in a global issue. Because Napoleon has come to power. Remember last year, y'all talked about the French Revolution, Bastille Day, and the commoners rising up and getting control of the government, right, and executioning people in the Reign of Terror. And eventually, at, at the end of that whole movement, we go back to a monarchy with Napoleon. And Napoleon's determined to be like Alexander the Great, right? Conquer all of Europe. And Napoleon, in the midst of this, and Britain, Britain and Russia, they're fighting each other. Britain, Ru Britain and Russia on one side, Napoleon on the other. And they realize that they're in a stalemate. In the Battle of Trafalgar, it's the British Navy that is superior, right? Because they have a better Navy. In Auschwitz, which is a land battle, who's superior? <coughs> Napoleon, because he has a better army. And so what they realize, if they can't win on sea, they can't win on land, let's attack each other's resources. But the US is the largest neutral carrier. Are the British attacking our soldiers that are on those boats, and are they attacking our cargo? Are the French doing the same thing? And so the US, according to Washington, says, what should we do in his farewell address? Stay out. Stop. Don't trade with them. Honor your existing commitments. But if they're not treating us fairly, don't trade with them. But what's going to happen if you look at your notes, the commercial warfare notes, remember those that have everything listed out? Napoleon, it starts off with the British Orders of Council, but I'm going to start it off with Napoleon Belon, because th that went wrong. It should have been the other one above it. All right, does everybody have this note set? Ah, if I could pull it up over here, Joe. Take it out. track the trade. So Napoleon's Berlin Decree. He says, no vessel coming from or touching a British port shall be received in any European port of France or her allies. So if the Americans went to Britain first, okay, and then they went to France, would they be able to trade? No. Is France respecting the independence and neutrality of the U.S.? So in reaction to this, they said no vessel can touch where? And be received in Europe. So this is going to result in the British coming in and putting the British Orders of Council, which is number 14 on your study guide. The British Orders of Council is going to say all vessels trading to or from enemy ports. What are enemy ports? Who would be the enemy? British. This is the British doing it. So who's the enemy? Oh. It's the French. Enemy ports, the French, shall be subject and captured. What's the word we know for capture? Impressment. And But unless, so if you go trade with the French, you're going to be captured. Here's the but, right? But if they first put in at a British port, pay a fee. What 
should this bring up in your mind? Pay a fee. Tax. Ooh, is that a nice word in America at this time? No, because it brings up memories of what? The revolution. If they pay a tax, they will obtain a certificate that they could go there. So are both of these guys trying to control our commerce? Mm -hmm. So looking at this, Napoleon says we can't trade with who? British. The British say we can't trade with? British. Unless we go and pay a fee. And this is going to bring up resentment amongst the Americans because we're going to remember what? The revolution. So Napoleon's going to come out with his own other decree called the Milan Decree to rebuttal this. He's going to say any vessel submitting to a search, if you submit to a search by the English ship and you pay this fee and it, to the English government, you're now considered an English vessel and you'll be liable to seizure. So even if we were trying to follow everybody's rules and we went to Britain, pay the fee, then went to France, what's going to happen to us? We're going to get seized. If we go to France, Who's going to seize us? The British. So looking at this, is there any way for the U.S. to neutrally trade with anybody? Okay. Do you see how we're getting in a pickle now? Even if we try to go to Portugal, what's going to happen to us? We're going to get seized by the British. Even if we go to Australia with our boat, which is a British colony, what's going to happen to us? We're going to get seized. So no matter what, are the waters safe? No. Okay, but who's the bigger threat here? Is it the French that are the bigger threat, or is it the British? The British. Why do y'all say the British are a bigger threat? They have a bigger navy. They have more boats, right? They're the biggest trader. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the other note set and look why the British are the bigger of the issue. So the British, oh gosh, they seize more American ships because they have a bigger what? Navy. The next issue deals with the Chesapeake affair. So where do you think, what body of water is this happening? Chesapeake Bay, which is between Virginia and Maryland. I don't know if y'all know about the rule of international waters. Any of you have ever been on a cruise? A couple people. Y'all know when you're on a cruise, anywhere within 10 miles of a country, their rules follow. Once that cruise gets out 10 miles, they sound a horn, and all of a sudden, all the drink stations open up, all the duty-free stuff that you could buy tax-free opens up, and all the fun commences because are there any rules 10 miles out? No. No. Okay. So in the Chesapeake affair, do you think we're 10 miles out or 10 miles within our borders? And so within those borders, should anybody be attacking the U.S.? No. They attack because they say on this boat, there's how many sailors? Four. Who are what? Americans or British? British. And the guy says, Get, bring them in. Do they give them over? No. So he gets upset and they fire on their boat, right? Should we have been fired within our boundaries? No. no. They needed to respect our laws. They weren't respecting it. And so this is going to flare up people saying, do the British respect us? They're still on our land. They're still on our waters disrespecting. The next thing is the British are helping the Native Americans by trading what with them? Weapons, Weapons in exchange for what? Fur. Fur. And our Native Americans that are here are attacking American settlers. And we see that Harrison's going out there to try to fight them, but are they giving resistance? And they're saying, look, if we got them to stop taking our ships, stop taking our men, stop arming our Indians, we wouldn't have issues with them. Do we have issues with the French? Yes. What are the French doing? They won't let us trade. They won't let us trade, but do the French have issues with us? Uh, what is the issues the French have with us? Debt. Debt. We haven't paid back our debt. So who do we have more issues with? The British. the British. And so our first reaction is let's be neutral. Our boats go out there. What happens? What do the French do? Seize them. What do the British do? 
So Jefferson is going to come up with the Embargo Act. So let's look at the Embargo Act on our commercial warfare notes. Okay, the U.S. Embargo Act. No ship shall clear. So can we leave? We're not leaving. So we shall not, a ship shall not clear to any United States foreign port. So what's going to happen to trade? Commerce. It's going to decline. No ship shall depart even for another American port. So can I trade from Boston to Charleston? No. No. So what's going to happen to our economy even further? We're not trading within our states. Go down. But here's the but, right? Here's our but. Without, you could leave, but this is what you have to do. You have to give a bond. And a bond is something of value, twice the value of the ship. So if your ship's worth a million dollars, how much much do you put down? Do you think people are going to do that? And the goods will be offloaded within the U.S. What area is our shipping in? New England. Do you think they want to follow this? They violate this, right? And what's going to happen to their boats when they go out? They're going to get sea, so did this even work? What happened to our economy? It went down. And so Jefferson, do you think people are going to like Jefferson now? The New England merchants are going to look at him saying, hey, you caused this. Our farmers, are they going to be affected? Yes, because can any of their raw materials go out in the ocean? So the farmers in the South and the West, they're also having problems. So this is why this next act comes out called the Non-Intercourse. The Non-Intercourse says all shipping and trade between the United States and British or French controlled ports, but not, but not to the rest of the world are prohibited. So who can't we trade with? Okay, so we're not trading with the British, we're not trading with the French, so no trade. But who can I trade with? I can trade with the rest of the world. Like Spain, Portugal. What are they hoping that this does to our economy? Boost it. Boost it. Hey, the moment our boat goes out to Spain, what do you think is going to happen? Seize. Seize. The moment it goes out to Portugal, what's going to happen? Seize. Oh, hey, is this going to work? So then they put in another but. If either Great Britain or France shall cease to stop, violating the neutral commerce of the United States, the trade will resume with that nation. So if one of them says, we will respect you, what are we gonna do? Trade with them. Do you think this is gonna work? No. No. So then, Madison has to come in and do Macon's bill. Macon's bill says intercourse, so I think about trade, okay, with France and Great Britain is renewed. So what are we going to do? Okay, but do you think they have stipulations? Once we go to Great Britain, who's going to attack us? Once we go to France, who's going to attack us? Okay, do you now understand this, this whole pickle that we're in? Okay, here's the but again. If either nation seizes, which means what? Stops, right? It's violations of American rights, and the other refuses to do so. So the other one who refuses to do so, the provisions of the non-intercourse law will be reimposed against the refusing nation. So looking at this, whoever says, I will respect you, are we going to trade with them? And the other one, what are we not going to do? Not trade trade with them. So who's the first country to be like, ooh, 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 I'll trade with you? France. France. And it's Napoleon, and you have to realize why Napoleon does this. Napoleon realizes by agreeing to this, who is the U.S. going to fight? And who is he fighting? And if Great Britain is now fighting on how many fronts? What has he just done with the military? And what can he do in Europe? Conquer because the British are going to be too busy fighting who? Do you understand why he's a military genius now? Can he even enforce this? Does he even have a navy to protect us? No, but he is doing this and agreeing to it, so who can he defeat? 
do you think the British are even going to catch this? No. It actually takes Russia to be like, look, Napoleon is pulling your tail. Let me what he, tell you what he's doing because of Macon's Bill number two. And once the British realize, do you think they're going to try to stop fighting the United States? And until Russia tells them that, that's when the fighting stops in the War of 1812. Okay, do y'all now, has the confusion from the study got, gone away now? Yes. Does it make sense? The U.S. is getting attacked because what are we doing with both nations? Trading. Trading. Did the U.S. even listen to Washington's foreign policy address about don't get entangling alliances? Isn't this, the, isn't this exemplifying us getting in trouble? Okay, y'all understand it? I haven't lost y'all? Yes. You've been found now? Good. Okay, so let's look at our notes. Do y'all understand each one of these acts now? No. Embargo, are we trading with anybody? No. no, not intercourse. Who are the two ones we're not trading with? British. Britain and France. Macon's bill, who are we trading with? France. France, and Napoleon only does it so Britain can fight how many? Two. Two. People and so Napoleon can now what? Conquer. Conquer. So the Warhawks, these are people who are from the South and the West. What party are they from? Democratic Republicans. And what they do is remember they've heard all their stories of their dads whooping the British in the American Revolution War, and their dads are being all proud and boastful, showing them their American Revolutionary ring. I don't know, I'm just making that up. They want to be able to go in and push the British around saying, you need to respect us on the seas, on our land, and in trade. The other thing is we want open seas because what issue is happening on the seas again with our men? Impressment, and then they're seizing our cargo. We look at additional land. When I think about those Indians, are the Indians allowing us to have that additional land? No, because what are they armed with? Weapons, and who's giving them those weapons? The other thing is we look at another place. Canada. That maybe if we fight the British this time and we obtain Canada, Canada could come into the Union. What type of states would Canada be? And I know we always think about it just frosted over and icy, but eventually in the summer, Canada becomes what? agricultural land so what type of land what type of states would we add in federalist or democratic republicans democratic. democratic republicans and so they're looking at this wow we get our lands from the indians we get canada we get impressment to stop and we show them who's boss these are the reasons the motivations for war which was on 20 the second part so our federalists are really looking at this war saying no we're not prepared what did Jefferson do with the military from our notes? He decreased it, right? The mosquito fleet, right? Is that going to be helpful in war? No. Okay. Unless they were real mosquitoes that could transfer disease and just kill everybody. Okay. The French also violated our neutrality. What were they doing? Huh? Seizing our ships. Seizing our, ships, seizing our men, <coughs> seizing our cargo. And New England says, this is not fair. Why are we attacking the British? They're our friends. So do we have a divisional war? The South and the West want to go to war. New England doesn't want to. So America will go to war, and this is a very quick war. We try to obtain Canada, but the Canadians fight back. And this is the one time that the Canadians are really successful. Just remind me, I have a little video on Canada attacking us. Um, the other thing is we have a naval war, and we realize from the Chesapeake affair what happened to our boat. It was bombed and it probably sank because it wasn't protected. So our boats, we're gonna put iron sides on it. What? By putting iron sides, what's gonna happen? Protects the... It protects it from those cannons and we can ram boats too. Um, our current Washington that we know today is not the Washington of this time. Washington is burned to the ground with, by the Canadians and the British soldiers who come in. You probably know this next one of Fort McHenry. You all know the Star Spangled Banner, right? Yeah. It, and I don't sing well, but there's a part of the Star Spangled Banner that says the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air. You all know that part? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and he he went to sleep on the boat, right? And then he wakes up the next day, and what does he see? Smoke. The flag, the smoke, and then he sees the flag still there. And that's the Battle of Fort McHenry we did not put down. And this is where we get the Star Spangled Banner from. Okay? Is it evenly divided, this war? Well, the British could possibly win, right? But who's going to warn the British? The, the Russia, right? Russia's going to come in and say, look, we're fighting Napoleon and taking the grunt of this war. And you're busy fighting over there the Americans. And is that even important? No, they're saying Napoleon is bamboozling you. Stop this war or we're going to let him take over Britain. Do they need to stop the war? This is why the Treaty of Git comes out. This is, okay, is anybody winning here? No. But they want to get out of the war. So what they're going to do is called an armistice. Do you know what armistice means? It's a ceasefire, truce. Anybody winning with a ceasefire? No. So we basically fought a war that has no winner. People have died. Do we resolve any of our issues? Did we resolve the issue of them being on our land? Did we resolve the issue of impressment? Do we resolve the issue of the seas? Do you now understand why this is the worst war fought in American history? Fought a war, did it resolve any of our issues? <laughs> the next thing that happens is, and this happens on Christmas. No one has gotten information, smoke signals, anything to Andrew Jackson out of New Orleans. Andrew Jackson's out there fighting the British. And he actually defeats them. Good. Does it count? No. It is after the buzzer, right? But Americans are like, yeah, in the background, we won. Did they? No. We just signed this treaty where we're saying no one wins. Have we resolved our issues? No. But then there's the Democratic Republicans running around. We are the champions, but it really doesn't count. There's going to be one group very bitter still, standing there just like, what group is that? Federalists. Federalists. And they're going to meet at Hartford. So I want us to go to this note set because I have stuff written out. I don't even know where it went. These Federalists are very upset. They're like, we fought a war and did we resolve any issues? No. Did we kill some people of our own? Do we have debt now? So these guys, and I want you to tell me the Federalist beliefs. What type of government do they believe in? They believe in a strong, central government. Okay. Do they want it to be close with all its powers and needs? Yes. Okay. Um, do they believe strict or loose? Uh, loose. Okay, so loose interpretation. Okay. States rights or no states rights? No states rights. I want us to look at the revisions that they have to the Constitution. They're going to meet in Hartford, Connecticut, and they're going to demand the following amendments to the new Constitution. They said representatives and direct taxes should be apportioned among several states according to their numbers of free persons. So they're saying people should only have representation in house based on their free people. Who are they trying to get rid of of county? This is, and who would that take away power from? This is trying to get rid of the three-fifths compromise and reduce whose power? Because they said if the South didn't have all that representation in the House, would we have gone to war? No. The next one. No new state shall be admitted into the Union into Congress without the concurrence of two-thirds of both houses. It used to be half plus one. Are they making it easier for Congress to do its job or harder? harder. Okay. 
Did they believe Congress should be given all the powers it needed, or should it be very limited? Well, they need, need all the powers needed. So is this giving them all the power they need? No. They're taking away power from this strong central government. Does that, is that synonymous with their beliefs? Yeah. No. No. Sorry. So they're decreasing the power of who? Uh, I'm going to write nicer. <laughs> Decreasing the power of government. Specifically who? Does that go with strong central government? No. no. Congress shall have no power to lay in an embargo. Okay, what are they salty about here? The embargo. So if Congress doesn't have any power to do this, are they giving Congress more power or are they decreasing the power? Decreasing. Does that go with their ideals of strong central government? No. no. Next one. Congress shall have no, not have power without the concurrence of two-thirds. So does two-thirds make it easier or harder? Harder. Harder of both houses to indirect the commercial intercourse between the United States and any foreign nation. So what are they salty about? about this commercial intercourse. Intercour Non-intercourse ask, Macon's bill. Are they making Congress power easier to do their stuff or are they decreasing their power? Decreasing the power. So same argument right here. Next one. Congress shall not make or declare war. Oh, hey, what are they upset about? War of 1812 or authorize, authorize acts of hostility against any foreign nation without the concurrence of two-thirds of both houses, except if such acts and hostilities in defense of the territories of the United States would actually be invaded. So are they giving Congress more power or taking it away? Taking it away. Taking away power. Does that go with this? No. No. What is that called when they believe this and then they go against it over here? Contradict or <laughs> hypocrite. Do y'all like listening to hypocrites? No. So everybody's like, hooray, we won the Battle of New Orleans, and here come the hypocrites. Debbie Downer saying, look, we're, we're just going to take power from Congress. We're going to go against our beliefs. Why do you think they have to go against their beliefs? Are they popular or are they the smaller force? Smaller. All right, let's look at the next one. No person who shall be hereafter naturalized. Who gets naturalized? What group of people gets naturalized? Immigrants shall be eligible to be a member of the Senate or the House. Okay, most immigrants, what party are they going to go to? So they said those people, those immigrants, cannot be people in the House, or can they hold any civil office under the authority of the United States? So basically, who are they trying to keep out of power? Democratic Republicans. The same person shall not be elected to the United States a second time, nor shall the president be elected from the same state in two terms of succession. They're trying to limit the presidency, right? To how many terms? Two, two. or one. Okay. And then from the same state. Think about the Virginia dynasty. Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, all from Virginia. What party are they from? Whose power are they trying to limit right here? They are trying to limit the control of the Democratic Republicans. Haven't the Federalists done this before in the French, that undeclared war between the French and the Americans? You don't remember the Alien and Sedition Act? This is just a repeat of what they were doing before. But do you think anybody's going to listen to them? Because we're like, hooray, we won in New Orleans, even though it counted. And now they're coming with all these corrections and revisements. Does anybody want to listen to them? And the Federalist Party will die. This convention leads. Just put, the Federalists die. They die. They're done. How many parties do we have now? Sorry, it's just like oh, <laughs> omniscient. <laughs> the cop going by. They have one party. We're going to enter an era called the era of good feelings because it's good feelings because how many parties do we have? One. one. This is how you kill a party. Go against your beliefs. 
All right? And y'all see that with your friends, right? They go against their beliefs, and you're just like, uh. Hey, do you understand this war a little bit better now? All right. What we're going to do now is you picked up another sheet. It kind of looks like the Jefferson sheet, right? It's a chart. We are going to look at events that happened after this war and determine if it's nationalism or sectionalism. So historians have labeled the period after the War of 1812 as the era of good feelings. Why? Who dies? The Federalists die. And we only have how many parties? One. And we're going to look to what extent is this statement true considering the emergence of sectionalism. Because we're going to see three key areas pop out of America in absence of parties. We're going to see three key sections. What do you think the three key sections are? Regions. Oh, hey, the north, the south, and the west. Okay? In absence of parties, we're going to have sectionalism, regionalism. So we're going to look at a couple of these events, and you're going to determine is it nationalism or is it sectionalism. We rebuilt the capital. During the War of 1812, which the United States and Great Britain, the foremost military power, fought to a draw, inspired an outburst of nationalistic pride. After the burning of the capital by the British troops, a more handsome national capital began to rise from the ashes of Washington. We get the White House, we get the Supreme Court, all of these buildings we know today. Is that nationalism or sectionalism? Nationalism. nationalism. Hooray America, we get our buildings. That's straight up nationalism. Let's look at the next one. We revived the bus. A revived Bank of the United States was voted by Congress in 1816. The second Bank of the United States soon became the focus of public resentment. Like its predecessor, it was a private profit-making corporation that served the government's financial agent, issuing paper money, collecting taxes, paying government debt. It was also charged with issuing paper money issued by local banks that had real value. The Bank of the United States was supposed to prevent an over-issuance of money. It was supposed to prevent local banks from issuing too much money and required them to hold enough gold to pay for money on hand. The bank could suspend operations. Does it sound like a national thing? It's trying to unite our banking system. Yeah, so it's nationalism, trying to create a unified, uniform banking system. Do you think everybody's going to love this bus? Yeah. What area do you think is going to like the bus? The north. And I'm just going to put they love the bus. Bank of the United States. Who's going to hate this bus? The bank. The south. I mean, here's my angry emoji. <laughs> and the west. They're not going to like the bus. Huh? So it's sectionalism, too. Many people think that the Civil War comes out of slavery. But now can I look at other issues causing the Civil War prior to 1860? This bus that's going to be kept around is going to create sectionalism. And when I divide the Civil War up, don't we see this Southwest contingency and Northwest contingency? We are basically going to start the Civil War from issues that happened after the War of 1812. And we'll see it more and more because I'm going to add more onto what they love and what they hate. The Warhawks. Do y'all remember what regions they were for him? Ah, uh, do we have sectionalism? Yes. yes, because who's not going to like the War of 1812? The North, because who do they say we should also go to war against? British. The British, so it's sectionalism. In recent elections of 1811, swept away many of the older submission men in Congress and replaced them with young hotheads, many from the South and the West of the Warhawks, by their Federalist opponents. The newcomers were indeed on fire for a new war with the old enemy. The war hawks were weary of hearing how their fathers had whipped the British single-handedly and they detested the manhandling of American sailors and how the European laws had damned the flow of the American trade. The war hawks yearned to wipe out the renewed Indian threat and the pi to the pioneer settlers who were streaming into the transatlantic wilderness. So who really is going to be part of the war hawks? Who's against them? Do I have sectionalism? Even though this war was supposed to be nationalistic, did, was it really nationalistic? 
Okay, let's look at our next one. The Star Spangled Banner. On a rainy day of September 13, 1814, the British sent down a pour of shells and rockets on Fort Henry. Francis Scott Key was aboard a ship in the Chesapeake and witnessed an attack. Well, when the dawn arrived and the smoke had passed, he saw the American flag over the fort announcing an American victory. He then put his thoughts together and a, used a popular English tune, and the song became known as the Star Spangled Banner. Nationalism or sectionalism? expansion. The onward march of the West continued. Nine of the frontier states had joined the original 13 between 1791 and 1819, with an eye on preserving the north-south sectional balance. Most of these states were been, had been admitted alternately, free or slaves. New immigrants and farmers from the Old South exhausted of land and moved west. The western boom was also stimulated by cheap lands or building of roads. So, nationalism or sectionalism? All right. Are we adding on to the U.S.? Yes. That's nationalistic, but why do y'all say this is also sectionalism? Because what are we doing? We're moving west. Uh, we're moving west, and are we creating a divide? Yes. What's this divide that we're creating? Free and slave, right? Is that what you're going to say? Okay. So can I go back to 1810 as being the origins for the Civil War? Yes. Okay. It's both, because nationalism, we're adding on to the union, but it's also sectionalism, because how are we creating problems for the future? The balance between the free and slave. The Navy defeated the pirates of North Africa. The Navy further covered itself with glory in 1815 when it administered a thorough beating to the botanical plunders of North Africa. Nationalism, we're defending our honor for trade, right? The Panic of 1819. Much of the good feelings went out in 1819 when the paralyzing economic panic descended. It brought deflation, depression, bankruptcy, bank failure, unemployment, soup kitchens, overcrowded pest houses known as debtor's prisons. It was the first national panic since Washington took office. Many factors contributed to the catastrophe in 1819, but a large problem was the overspeculation of frontier lands. The West was hardest hit because many of the branches of the Bank of the United States had invested in buying frontier lands. The banks foreclosed on mortgages on countless farms. In the eyes of the Western debtor, the Nationalist Bank of the United States soon became a financial devil. Angry emoji face. Nationalism or sectionalism? sectionalism? Because who are they going to blame that this panic was started by? The West. And is the North going to like the West? No, they're going to be very upset. So the West started this because they were trying they were trying to make the Western frontiers like Las Vegas. People go to Las Vegas to do what? Gamble to make money. And they're gambling on this land that they buy it cheap, they could sell it what? Expensive. And were they able to? When they couldn't sell that land, could they pay back the bank? No, and that's why they're upset with the bank. So are people going to be upset? Sorry, there is a message, and I just need to flip it up so it can record us. Okay. Okay. Henry Clay's American system. The American system began with a strong banking system. Who's going to be upset? West, West and the South, which could provide easy and abundant credit. Who's going to be happy with the easy and abundant credit? Mm -hmm. The North. Clay also advocated for a protective tariff in which the Eastern manufacturers would flourish. So who's going to be upset with the tariff? West. Who's going to be upset with the tariff? West. Who's going to like the tariff? 
Revenues gushing from the tariff would provide funds for networks of roads and canals. These new arteries of transportation would flow foodstuff and raw materials from the south to the west and the north to the east. In exchange, a stream of manufactured goods would flow in return direction, knitting the country together economically and politically. So who should be happy about the roads? Everyone. Except the roads and canals only connect this area. They said that the south can use boats. So who's going to hate the roads and canals? That's just bitter. The north is making the south bitter. The west, are they going to like it? Yes. The north also realizes they kind of are like, eh. I don't even know how to say eh in, I know masa menos in Spanish. Um, like, they're like iffy on the roads and canals because the roads and canals, they, yeah, they send their manufactured goods out, but do they also lose people here? So they're iffy on this because they lose people, but sell items, All right? Who's just really in love with these roads and canals? The West. Are we having sectionalism? Yes. Tariff. Oh, we already know this one. Who's going to love the tariff? North. The North. Who's not going to like the tariff? Well, first, South. South and? West. Nationalism or sectionalism? Yes. But it was to protect our American industries by American. Is it also nationalism? Yes. Yes, to protect our industries. And you probably hear this with Trump. Oh, this is the one that we're missing on the front side, right? You probably hear this with Trump. We're going to put tariffs to protect our nation from foreign goods, right? It's a very nationalistic thing. Let's do one more. Oh, wait. Building of roads and canals. Nationalism or sectionalism? Huh? You say both? It's supposed to bring our country together economically? <laughs> Gosh, you got out of order. Sorry. Okay, roads and canals. It's supposed to be nationalistic. It's going to bring our nation together economically, right? But did everybody like the roads? Who doesn't like the roads? Who loves the roads? Who's iffy about them? Because it drains their population, but it also brings them what? Money, sales. It's both. We're going to end right here, and then I'll finish up with y'all on tomorrow. Y'all's homework, I think I've covered a good portion.